Okay. Um, so welcome to Combating Antisemitism, Learning to Actively Address Bias and Stop the Escalation of Hate. Um, really excited about this program. Uh, I know we have addressed these kinds of issues with respect to other communities, but this is a first for this um, committee. So uh, great opportunity to learn. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to share with you a couple of housekeeping announcements. Um, you will be receiving your MCLE certificate shortly after the program. Sometimes it's paired up with a survey, so uh, feel free to respond to that and give us some feedback in the vein of continuous improvement. Your certificate will also be stored in BHB, BHVA+, our members-only community. Um, and this program will be available on archive for those accessing it on demand. Uh, that is one of our newest member benefits presented by Lawyers Mutual Insurance Company. So now on to the program. I'm thrilled to introduce you to Jeffrey Abrams. He is the regional director of the Western Region, um, uh, of, sorry, of the ADL Los Angeles office within the Western Region, which has uh, a number of offices um, throughout Seattle, Las Vegas, and Arizona. His background initially was a spectacular litigator and business advisor background from well-known firms such as Kat Mukin, Wolf Rifkin, and Rosenfeld, Meyer, and Sussman. And as I discovered, he was also in-house at Universal Music Group. Um, although I don't think we had the opportunity to overlap when I was in family entertainment and features divisions, legal departments. Uh, in any event, he's also got extensive mediator experience volunteering with LA Superior Court and the United States Central District of California Court, as well as serving as an arbitrator for the International Film and Television Alliance. He has an extensive policy background ranging from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and various involvements with the Advisory Council for Bet Zedek. Um, I know we have a lot of members of Bet Zedek in our BHBA community, very thrilled about that, as well as a past director of the Jewish Federation of the Greater Los Angeles area. He's a graduate of Cornell Law School and UC Berkeley. Um, and before we get started, I would like to note that Mr. Abrams appears to have been extremely busy in the LA office. I did peruse the Facebook screens and discovered a lot of exciting developments with our new mayor and LA City Council, as well as the Choose Kindness Project in conjunction with the NAACP, Latino Federation, Special Olympics, and LGBTQ community groups as well to combat uh, bullying and to support mental health wellness for youngsters. So now I'm going to turn the program over to you, Jeffrey. Welcome. Thank you so very much. It's such a pleasure to be here. And, and I and I have to say it's it's a, it's a pleasure in several ways. One, I grew up in Beverly Hills. So I'm a product of the Beverly Hills schools, had recently spoken to the school district board. It's just a pleasure as a native born son to be here. And as a practicing attorney, I began my legal career at 9100 Wilshire, working at Freshman Moran. Some of you may remember that firm. And when I concluded after 25 years, my active practice at the end of 2018, I ended it back in Beverly Hills where I began. So it really is a, a pleasure to be here, an honor to be here, and to be representing ADL, which I've been fortunate to do for the last two and a half years. What I wanna to do today is share with you a little bit about who we are, what the anti-defamation does, so there's some context, so that when I share with you information and statistics, data, you can really understand what the current state of anti-Semitism is in Los Angeles and in our country, and then also get into the roots of anti-Semitism. What is it? Why is it different than other forms of hate? And then ultimately what all of us can do to combat it. ADL is over 100 years old. We were founded in 1913 during a time of rising systemic anti-Semitism in this country, where Jews could not own homes in certain areas, obtain loans in certain areas, work in certain industries, go to certain schools, and ultimately what was the catalyst to the creation of ADL was the lynching of Leo Frank, 
a Jewish businessman in Atlanta, wrongfully accused of killing a Christian girl, dragged from his cell and lynched. And from the very start in our founding, we've had an integrated mission to stop the defamation of the Jewish people. And as a defamation lawyer, it's far more than just defamation. And to secure justice and fair treatment to all, recognizing from the inception, Jewish community could not be safe if others were not safe. And so too, other communities would never be safe if the Jewish community is not safe. ADL then, we focus on three core pillars of our work, countering global anti-Semitism, fighting domestic extremism, and building a just and inclusive society for all. And as was mentioned, as one of the oldest civil society organizations in the country, we do th so with 25 regional offices around the country. I'm proud to lead the LA office, which is one of the largest in the country and the flagship for the Western Division. We are fundamentally at our core nonpartisan, which means we report data and facts as we see it, but not we are not a political organization. We are not a Jewish organization. We are the world's oldest anti-hate organization. Now we focus on countering global anti-Semitism in a variety of ways. We do so, one, like any good lawyers, and I certainly respect, we have a plan. And our combat plan brings all the various resources of society because it's an all of society problem, which we urge everyone to be engaged in. We work with synagogues so that we're providing resources, the ability to respond to incidents, which are all too frequent. And we also have recently launched the Center for Anti-Semitism Research, which applies a applied research network to really examining what is current anti-Semitism and what are the interventions that will work, not just what our gut, what our feel is, but what will actually from an applied research perspective work. We also fight domestic extremism. As our attorney general has said, and as the secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas, who comes from Los Angeles, who was the US attorney here in Los Angeles, this is the greatest threat to our nation, domestic extremism. So we at ADL, we actually have a center of excellence, our center on extremism. We have approximately 50 analysts who are monitoring the dark web, looking for expressions, threats, and this particularly leading up to the 2020 election, we were sounding the alarm. We were seeing red flags. We were seeing the alarms ringing loudly, hearing the alarm ringing loudly. We were warning governments, elected officials, and on January 6th, we were providing live intelligence and information to law enforcement because we do these research reports. We're in fact going to be releasing in May of this year a report specifically, specifically on hate in the Golden State, so that we've done in Florida and New York and some other regions. If you go to our website and our Center on Extremism, two really interesting things there for you. One's a heat map. It actually is a live dynamic map of all extremist activity that occurs here in our country. You can go in different parts of, our country, uh, of the map, see what's occurring, some of which sadly is occurring within our own area. You can also go and see hate on display, which shows in powerful detail, many of the signia, many of the badges, many of the, the words and tattoos that are the hallmark of the white extremists. So we do this work and we track this work so that we can share it. We share it with government, we share it and inform law enforcement, media, policymakers, because it is a true threat to everyone in our country. Now, one of the things we do from our Center on Extremism is since 1979, for over 40 years, we track anti-Semitic incidents around the country. Now, by incidents, those are incidents of harassment, assault, and vandalism. And by doing it for such a long period of time, we're able to have a baseline. And sadly, 2021 was the worst rec year on record of this survey. Four of the worst years in the history of the survey were within the last five years. 2,717 incidents, which is a 34% increase year to year, represents on average seven anti-Semitic incidents each and every day. And as you see on the right with the map, it's across our country. 
mostly occurring within states that have large Jewish populations in California and New York and New Jersey and Florida. But look at the map. There's no state that is immune from this. So we compare this year to year and you see the dramatic upsurge in assaults in 2021. Remember 2020, we were all in our homes. Well, once people came back onto the streets, came back onto campuses, there was an explosion, particularly of assaults. Here in California, if you look at us more as a region, San Luis Obispo down to Orange County, because hate has no border. We saw a 41% overall increase in these anti-Semitic incidents. Here in Los Angeles, here in Los Angeles in 2021, we recorded 182 incidents. Now to be clear, that's not every report we get. Some are duplicative, some are not what we would evaluate as a true anti-Semitic incident. We need the data to be good because data drives policy. And if you look at this between 2021 and 2017, that represents a 217% increase. And of the assaults that occurred, 15 in California, 14 occurred right here in Los Angeles in 2021. And what we saw, what was the expression that we saw in 2021 and continues? It's a normalization of this hate, this harassment. You see chalk written on sidewalks, and this occurred throughout LA County. We saw it in Venice in particular in 2021. You see signs being posted, vile, awful signs. And unfortunately, what we also saw in 2021 and 2022 is a particular group of white extremist provocateurs, propagandists, who have been leaving leaflets, leaflets, blaming every ill of society on the Jewish community. And you see it here from the media to COVID, to finance, to even a company like Disney. And they take these handbills, they put them in plastic bags filled with sand or salt or, or rice or pebbles, and they throw them onto people's doorsteps and driveways, meant to terrorize a community. The same group drove through Beverly Hills last year, drove through Beverly Hills with these vile, horrifying buses, again, meant to poke at ADL, you see us, our logo on the bus, because we track these people. We know who these people are. They come to our city with these kind of insignia, Nazi insignia, again, to intimidate, to terrorize. And so it's continued in 2022. We've seen billboards from a different group that were targeted over one of the Jewish holidays on the, in the Melrose Fairfax area. We've seen other types of leaflets distributed. And what we saw in October was really the impact of when you have all these extremists, these hateful groups continuing to propagate this anti-Semitism. It then gets lifted up by people who have huge public profiles. Yay, formerly known as Kanye West doubling down, tripling down, attacking Jewish people, attacking Jewish businessmen, declaring death con three on the Jews. And the impact of someone who has twice as many followers as there are Jewish people on this planet is that everyone who wants to hate was emboldened. He became Kanye West, yay, the hero of not only the, bra the black Hebrew Israelites and the nation of Islam, as they wished ill on the Jewish people, but also extremists. There was a new hero. And that new hero now had his army. And we saw that in LA at the end of October, early November, on the 405 freeway, on the Jefferson overpass, the same group hung a sign, Kanye is right about the Jews, terrorizing our community. Imagine, if you will, that you're a Holocaust survivor, Imagine, if you will, that you're someone who identifies as being Jewish and is driving your children. This is what has been infecting our city. And of course, what we're seeing 
on our streets, on our freeways, also has what has become the world's greatest propellant of hate, which is social media, unregulated. And it has become in so many ways where some of the greatest harm is occurring. We did a study May of 2021 when there was an outbreak of violence, armed conflicts overseas in the Middle East. And we saw an explosion on social media. We saw, as you see here, over 17,000 tweets, 17,000, some variant of Hitler was right. We saw it across all of these platforms. We have one of our centers of excellence is our Center on Technology and Society, where we work with the social media companies. We try to, but we also work oppositionally. We report these kind of things. And then when action is not taken, we try to get all of you to take action. And so we also track what we're seeing in terms of hate being spread online. Now, the good and the bad news is that Jewish people experience online harassment at a similar rate as non-Jewish people. But that's still 37% who are reporting some form of online harassment. For Jewish people, for Jewish people, they identify the source of harassment as their religion, 37% as opposed to 14% who are non-Jewish. The internet, social media is what is spreading the hatred, what is helping to normalize the hatred. So it has real life consequences. You see from our study in 2021 that these anti-Semitic incidents are impacting all types of places, not just Jewish institutions, but our public square, our non-Jewish schools, our streets. And as I alluded to before, in May of 2021, that violence came to Los Angeles. At a restaurant on La Cienega Boulevard, La Cienega Beverly, a sushi restaurant called Sushi Fumi, four young Persian Jewish people were having dinner together along with a non-Jewish friend. A caravan of cars, 10 to 15 vehicles, which had been menacing the west side of Los Angeles, bullhorns, flags, jump out of their car and demand to know who is a Jew. Now, those young Persian Jewish people who many of them had family who came to this country escaping persecution, they weren't going to hide who they were. We are. I am. And for that, they were savagely beaten. The perpetrators, the perpetrators have been arrested, and two of them have been charged with hate crimes, because that's what it was. And it wasn't the only example of violence. There's also the day earlier, some of the same cars chased a visibly orthodox man through a parking lot with their cars. A week after this incident, two young boys were walking in the neighborhood, visibly identified uh, a head covering, a kippah, and, and what are called seat seat. They were shot with paint guns. It has consequence. The beginning of 2022, we had a hostage situation in Colleyville, Texas, near Fort Worth. An armed intruder who had come from England, obtained a gun, took over the synagogue, took its rabbi and three members hostage. And why? Because of his belief in anti-Semitic tropes. First, there was a convicted terrorist at a nearby federal penitentiary. This hostage taker believed that if he took a rabbi hostage, he must know the rabbi he saw from New York in a picture with President Obama. And because all of the Jews must know each other and are so powerful, that President Obama would simply order the release of that prisoner. Filled with anti-Semitic tropes, the Jewish community was on edge. That thankfully resolved itself with no loss of life for the hostages. It has, and what we see, real life consequences. Poway, California, down in San Diego, 2019, someone barged into a Chabad synagogue, shot at the rabbi, killed one of the congregants. A few months earlier, 
October of 2018, Pittsburgh, the Tree of Life Synagogue. An anti-Semite stormed into the congregation that morning and took 11 Jewish lives, the largest life of Jewish life in our country's history. These are the times we are living in. And what I want to get into you with you now is really to understand a bit of what is anti-Semitism? Where did it come from? Now, many of you on this call may be Jewish and have some of this background. Many of you may not be. But even for those who are Jewish, part of what everyone's responsibility, and I do put it to you as responsibility, is to understand this unique form of hatred so that you can do what you can in your lives to interfere, to disrupt this growing hatred in our country. Now, anti-Semitism, and it's important to be clear from the start, it's who are the Jewish people? And that's a very complex question. It's a complex question because it's not just one race, the Jewish people. It's multiracial. There's an estimate that 20% of Jewish people are Jews of color. And many of those were born Jewish. Not everyone converted. It's more than just a religious group. Some people just identify ethnically. For some people, their biggest connection is to an ancestral homeland in Israel. But it's diverse. It's not just one thing. And that's part of the complexity in dealing with all this and the anti-Semitism that grows in different communities. But fundamentally, when we're talking about anti-Semitism, and even the definition of itself can be challenging, we're fundamentally for this discussion today talking about a marginalization or oppression of people who either are Jewish or perceived to be Jewish. That's what we're talking about. And so in many other, like many other forms of bias, and I appreciate all of you joining us for today what is one of the hardest MCLEs to get, all those forms of bias, there is commonality. It is built into the societal structure. It can occur because people are overt about it. And then often, and if we give people good grace, sometimes, even often, what comes out is not intended to be anti-Semitic, but nevertheless, it has that impact. And that's true of all different forms of racism, all different types of communities, but there are obviously some things, or maybe not so obviously, that are unique and different about anti-Semitism. Now, the term itself is obviously, is, is often problematic. It's a term that was used to connote Jew hatred developed in the late 1800s in Germany. Make no mistake, sometimes people get into linguistics, gymnastics, about who's a Semite and who isn't. I testified the other day at the LA County Supervisor meeting, and one of the people in opposition to a motion to study anti-Semitism, one of the people in opposition went, frankly, on quite a rant about how they were Semites, and so they could not be anti-Semitic. That term, when it's used, it really connotes Jew hatred, hatred of the Jewish people. The linguistic uh, gymnastics are, are just that. Now, there are certain tropes, certain stereotypes, which infect really all forms of anti-Semitism through all of time. Power, disloyalty, greed, deicide, having killed Christ, along with blood libel, Holocaust denial, and really the most modern form is anti-Zionism. All, as I'm gonna talk about, they adapt, but they're all part of the uniqueness that is anti-Semitism. Now, very quickly, and sort of talk about some stages, this could be a semester long course, about the history of anti-Semitism. But it started in pre-Christian days as really just cultural differentiation. Jewish community set itself apart in their eating habits, marriage customs, and others. Different, other. But that's where it initiated. Then it evolved or devolved. During the Christian era, it became much more focused on this charge of deicide, that the Jewish people were responsible for the death of Christ. 
And that led into this connotation of Jewish people having powers, evil powers. And it was really that divine misfortune that entitles people to have this hatred of Jews. As things evolved politically, things took a different tone. Pre-Nazi pre Germany, but leading up to it, where the hatred of the Jewish community became much more racial and political. And it became identified with capitalism as the source of all social problems. It started what has now become a pattern of one of the uniquenesses of anti-Semitism is that at the same time, someone that can accuse the Jewish community of being responsible for the downfall because of capitalism and also having inspired socialism. It's the same kind of thing we saw with some of those posters where they accused the Jewish community of being responsible for COVID and the Jewish community profiting from COVID vaccines. This all starts to develop as the Jewish community being disloyal and very racial, racially focused. And it all leads up to development of greater tools to express hatred towards the Jewish community. The, El the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Now this was something that was concocted by Russian intelligence as a way to separate out the Jewish community, to demonize the Jewish community, and really to articulate this grand conspiracy. And it's this grand conspiracy that so dominates anti-Semitism. And lest you think that this old form of propaganda no longer has any currency, shortly after the January 6th insurrection and attack, a staffer was leaving one of the government office buildings in DC and at one of the security guard stands, he found a dog-eared copy of the protocols of the elders of Zion. It continues. And in this case, it all led up to, and it's particularly apt that we're talking today, the greatest loss, the greatest darkness that we've seen in our human history. The Holocaust, the Shoah. Tomorrow, tomorrow, January 27th, is International International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which commemorates the liberation of Auschwitz. So these topics, as much as they are decades or centuries old, unfortunately continue to have a resonance today. Now, like I mentioned, anti-Semitism is but one of many forms of racism, marginalization, hate, bias, but it is unique in certain ways. And fundamentally, what makes it so unique is, it's being, is that it's tied into a grand conspiracy. This idea, and really personified in 2017 at the March in Charlottesville, I am sure many of you recall these men walking with lit tiki torches. The Jews will not replace us. That is not that Jewish people are going to take my job. It's that Jewish people are going to engage in a broad conspiracy to manipulate brown and black people to take over and destroy, in this case, the white extremist way of life. It's unique. And that's what makes it in part so complex but almost at every trope, the under, the rooting is in this conspiracy. So I'm gonna go through 10 things that are unique about anti-Semitism. And the first is really, it's enduring. It has started, it's biblical. It goes back to the fear that the Jewish people in Egypt would rise up. We have for decades done a study of attitudes, we call it our global 100, six simple questions that have historically been used to assess anti-Semitic attitudes in different countries around the world, including the US. To the question, Jews are more loyal to Israel than in this country, 41% around the globe agreed with that statement. This slide is a little outdated. 
In the US, the number we use is 24%. We just released a new study with updated questions to the same question. It was somewhere around 34% of US citizens. And this is a sample who would agree with this basic notion that the Jewish community is not loyal to where they live, but to someone else. It's adaptive anti-Semitism. It morphs to the times that it's in. Sometimes it's very religious, sometimes it's more economic. But the thing about it is, is it often provides that release during a time of, of, of turmoil, somewhat like we are in right now, to blame someone, Anti-Semitism often becomes the, the, um, the favorite tool to stoke this division and take advantage of the anxiety in society. It's paradoxical. Like I said a bit before, Jewish communities are both blamed for capitalism and socialism. Oftentimes, the allegation is that the Jewish community does not blend in enough and then and sticks to its own. But sometimes, and if you go back to the Holocaust, it was a threat to purity. This is unique. It's unique in that part of it is, is that the core anti-Semite or those simply holding anti-Semitic attitudes and beliefs will believe that the Jewish people are both beneath them and that they're above them engaged in some conspiracy. It's fundamentally inconsistent, but yet it persists. And again, this idea of this conspiracy of bringing everything together, it's not just pure prejudice. It's much more than that, which is why it's often that first form of prejudice, that canary in the coal mine. And like I mentioned before, it can be overt or it can be unconscious and implicit. Part of it is how you deal with it. Some of us may have said things that had an unintended impact on someone else. The impact is, is real, regardless of what the intent was. And this is true, obviously, for many different forms of racism and bias. But it is also particularly true when you hear phrases over and over that people use. I didn't mean anything by it. Some of my best friends are Jewish. It's also very racialized as a form of bigotry. And make no mistake, and there's been a fair amount of controversy this year, particularly from Whoopi Goldberg and The View, who made the comment that the Holocaust was not about race. It is. It is. Because those who seek to demonize, to attack, to harm the Jewish community, for them, all of the Jews are part of a race which cannot be avoided, regardless of the color of the skin. Often takes us to the political dimension as well. On the left, and on the right, it's obviously been used along with extremism, sort of the, 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 the brothers and sisters of each other, but we've also seen it appearing more and more and more on the left. One of the ways to think about it, the current state of the two different forms, on the right, it's violent. It's in front of you. You see it. It's unavoidable. And the vast majority of extremist actions, physical harm are from the right. On the left, in many ways, the anti-Semitism, it's, it's somewhat like global warming. It's happening around us. The intensity is increasing. Either way, you end up dead. And that's the concern of both sides of this. Unfortunately, we're right in the middle. As I also shared, it's often becomes legalized and lethal. Legalized in the form of, of, again, our country has a history of preventing Jewish community members from participating fully in society. What our work is at ADL in part is to make sure we never reach that ultimate harm. It's why our CEO and National Director, Jonathan Greenblatt, just wrote a book. And, and the book is, It Could Happen Here. We're sounding the alarm because we see indications that are very troubling for society. 
And it's not just about the Jews. It's not just about the Jewish community. It's this fantasy. It's this times we're in. It's a reflection of so much that we're troubled with of the current state of affairs. Still the greatest country on earth. But we're troubled about it. We're troubled when we see this polarization. We're troubled when we see the upheaval financially. We're troubled when we see the polarization at its extremes. All these are coming together at once. And it really becomes anti-Semitism, the canary in the coal mine. And by that, we mean it's the first sign, but it goes along other aspects of an erosion of a society, an erosion of a democracy, impingement of voting rights, attacks on the free press, conspiracy theories, everywhere you look. These are reasons to be concerned, not to give up, but to be concerned. And we all have a part in this. We all have a part in this because the last few years have been terrible. It's all come together in this one hodgepodge and COVID really so much catalyzed, so much of the anger. While we're seeing this horrible rise in incidents against the AIPI community, we are also seeing this proliferation of hate directed to the Jewish community, responsible for COVID, not preventing vaccines, enabling vaccines, but profiteering on vaccines. And we're still living in the shadow of that. So what can we all do to actively stop some of this? So first, it's really awareness. And this happens in all of your worlds, in all of your workplaces, particularly in larger firms. But you see things that happen, whether it's this kind of microaggressions or outright harassment, because they're different. Sometimes it's the hostility that is felt in the workplace. Some Jewish people feel reluctant to speak up on certain issues because they're putting themselves at risk. They're putting themselves at risk, not least not just speaking out against anti-Semitism, but they're putting themselves at risk if, for example, and I did a similar type of briefing like this for all of the bench officers of the LA Superior Court uh, at the end of uh, 2020. And one of the things we talked about was also religious holiday accommodation. The fact is, is there's more than just two Jewish holidays, than Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, where it seems everyone takes that off. There's a second day of Rosh Hashanah, which is also a holiday celebrated by many. Passover, Passover occurs over a period of time, the first two days, that's a holiday where you're not supposed to work when the seders occur. So too in the last two uh, days of the holiday, if you're at that level of observance. So you need to be aware of that when you're dealing with your colleagues, when you're dealing with opposing counsel, when you're dealing with witnesses. Because when you don't, if you refuse to, it adds to this feeling of isolation and no one should be experiencing this. And so it really requires sometimes for you to really, not sometimes, it requires you to be proactive because if you don't look out for it, first off, it's wrong. Secondly, it's gonna neg negatively impact your performance, the performance of your firm, your practice. It's not going to go away. And in fact, what a number of firms have done and maybe larger firms in particular has been to, to create Jewish employee resource groups. Something that's occurred for a lot of other communities in a lot of larger organizations. There should also be one for Jewish people because they have unique experiences. What you can do is when you do see or hear of something to report it, do not be silent. And that includes in your work life. So I was a mediator for several years. And when I was mediating, there was one period where 
I got rid of the lawyers. I brought the parties in. We sat down. And one party to the other said, you're not going to start jewing me down, are you? Now, in that moment, I did nothing. I sat there. I reflected. I was a mediator. My role is to get the deal done. I said nothing. And as you can tell, since I speak of this, to this day, it bothers me because I should have spoken up. You need to speak up. It's simply not acceptable for some of this language to continue. You have to be an ally, Jewish and non-Jewish. So you have your role as well. One of the biggest things we do in fighting anti-Semitism is also make sure that policy is reflective of where we are. Call your legislators up in Sacramento. Last year, ADL, we helped pass a bill. It's called AB 587, Social Media Accountability and Transparency Act. Every social media company now, 100 million or more in revenue, the large ones, has to actually report to the state attorney general. What are your policies on hate speech, Holocaust denial, Islamophobia, homophobia? And then what do you do about it? How many pieces of content are you taking down? And how does it relate to the total? You can't hide in the dark anymore. And ADL, I was very proud to help draft that legislation and work with Assembly Member Gabriel to get what is a first in the nation type of law. But you have that role as well to join us. If you see a hate crime, if you see a crime, call 911. If you see a hate crime incident that has an anti-Semitic aspect to it, call us. We're here to help. We're here to help bring ADL into your schools. We have a variety of programs. One in particular, No Place for Hate, is a peer-led program, K through 12, where with three activities during the year, the students focus on what needs to be done so that it's a better environment. And we do this in large schools, small schools, private schools, school districts. And we also introduce and have available our programs on Holocaust education. Because one of the tragedies right now is our young people simply don't know about something that was only a few decades ago. So overall, what we ask you to do is, and we're going to provide resources with you already have been provided. You can go to our website. So you, you're going to see things like anti-Semitism uncovered. Really take a look at that of the six traditional tropes that I mentioned earlier. We have short videos on each one. And they're really effective ways to communicate with younger people, with non-Jewish people, really effective resource as are all the ones that are listed in that calendar of observances. But ultimately, as we are seeing anti-Semitism surge, the data is there, it's not just in our gut. And as we're seeing some of the underlying reasons for this, what we ask of all of you is to speak up. When you see something, speak up. When you're speaking up, share facts. And really, as lawyers, I can't encourage you enough to do the study. Understand what it is that we need to defend. Understand that if you look at our hate display database, the symbols, you'll learn that when there's someone who has a tattoo that says 8-8, eight, 8 eight is the, the eighth letter of the alphabet is H. So 8-8 eight, eight stands for HH. Heil Hitler. You don't want somebody like that amongst you, but you need to know that. And then ultimately, everyone, we need you to show strength for each other, for your colleagues, for your peers. This is a time where the Jewish community feels unsettled. That survey of attitudes I mentioned that we just released with updated questions, 20% of Americans, according to our survey, 20% have core anti-Semitic attitudes. They believe in six or more anti-Semitic tropes. So we need to be strong. We need your partnership. 
And I very much hope that this was helpful for everyone. Hopefully it was uh, something where we and I shared some, some new information. But fundamentally, we are here. I am here. We're here to make our community safer. We're here to fight against the scourge of anti-Semitism. And very much appreciate and welcome uh, any of your, your, your questions and comments. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. We're right. We're looking good on time too, folks. So we're doing great. Hi, Jeffrey. Um, I don't know. I know sometimes when one is presenting PowerPoints, you can't see the questions. I do see that we do have uh, four questions. There had been some uh, technical uh, technology questions and other things earlier in the session that were otherwise resolved. Um, would you like me to present them or would you like to go ahead and oh, jump I, into them yourself? I know I now have them. So let, let me take a, a quick a quick look here. Um, it looks as if Marcy shared a personal um, professional yeah. um, observation supporting your comments about um, the challenges of of recognition of various holidays and yeah. uh, so, so, some so are requesting I, I, some helpful pointers. So I'll let you handle the questions then. All right, I'll take it from there. And I see some uh, friends as well who ask questions. So thank you. So I, I, I want to start with a, a, a question that, uh, and, and really the exact words that we use is how to tactfully tell someone that they are professing anti-Semitic tropes or views, i.e. that they are anti-Semitic. And I think within your question is really the best way to do it. So first, of course, try to be tactful. Now, sometimes that's not possible, but it's part of, if you want to engage and you believe there's good grace on the other side, then you have to start from that position. You also have to really own that the impact may be different than the intent. And so rather than calling someone an, an anti-Semite, which I have to tell you, even ADL, we do not do very often. So if you see us using it, it's very intentional. But if you can educate that what you're saying is really a, a, a really stereotype. It's, 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 an, it's, it's not true. It's an anti-Semitic trope. And explain to them why. This is part of your own education, right? So that if someone says, oh, Soros is behind all this. Soros being behind all this is a code for many of Jewish control, of Jewish money. So you have to do what your part is. And I very much appreciate that, uh, that question. Uh, I'm also, we also have a question here um, that some of these things are complex and I'm just gonna raise up as, as Judy Kim points out, that number 88 in certain cultures in the Chinese culture is, is a sign of good luck. So this is the complexity. It's not all black and white. This is again, why counselors, it's so good to be amongst you because that's what we do. That's what we do. Uh, next, what can people do and who should they report to if they see instances of discrimination out in the community? So there's a variety of ways you can do this. So again, if you see someone who is in danger of physical harm, call 911, 911, hard stop. If it's something of an anti-Semitic nature, report it to us. We have on our website, an incident reporting tool you fill it out, one of my team will get back to you. We're in many ways sort of that first response for the Jewish community. For other communities, well, part of what we're doing right now is using our good offices to help train other communities that don't have the depth, the history that we do. We're very proud, for example, that we help launch something called the Asian American Foundation, trying to do many of the things we do. So we share our best practices with them there also uh, are two numbers. Uh, you can call 211 for the county and 311 for the city or, or vice versa, so you'll excuse me. But those are also places that you can report to that will be there to assist. I'm gonna continue on if I can. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about campus uh, because I have a couple questions about 
what life is like on, on campus right now for students and, and what we do or what anyone can do. So first and foremost, talk to your students on campus. Don't read about it from organizations, even like ADL. Talk to the people who are impacted. It's where we start. If something happens on a campus here in Los Angeles, I always start by we call the whoever's running Hillel. That's our principal partner. Because we want to understand what's going on on campus. Because sometimes some very dangerous things happen on campus. Sometimes there are things that are overblown. Sometimes there are things that happen on campus that receive a great deal of commentary and attention. And after it's left, the students on campus are left to pick up the pieces. So what we do, we work closely with Halal. We help to educate them and have resources for them when it comes to anti-Semitism. Our reporting tools are embedded within the Halal world. But we also work collaboratively. And so as an example, uh, there's an upcoming conference in a, in a couple of weeks on UCLA's campus uh, that's going to bring people on the campus who are very oppositional to Israel. We want to do our best to make sure that that environment is as safe and supporting as possible for the students who are there. And to be successful in doing that requires working with them. So that, that really is how we work on campus. While we can do all the other things we do to fight anti-Semitism, to fight some real terrible anti-Zionistic activity, just last week, I was dealing with a, a group that was trying to boycott an LA-based company, calling them sneaky Jews who are selling dangerous products and posting pictures of their children. So we do all this looking at about the total impact in the community. Um, I'm just gonna look at a few more of the questions we have here. Um, so there's a couple questions. Uh, that uh, are surrounding Israel. Uh, and I wanna talk to, although I can answer one question real quickly about the statute I mentioned that deals with social media companies is AB 587, simple answer. The other one's not so simple. There's a new government that has come into uh, Israel. It's uh, identified as the most right-wing government in the history of Israel. Here at ADL, we call balls and strikes as we see them. We criticize the government of Israel. We are in favor of the two-state solution. But when there's things being done and policies being activated that we disagree with, we use our voice as a leading organization fighting anti-Semitism and working towards a just and inclusive society. One of the things that I think is particularly important as we go forward and even as we reflect back, one of the things that really reached a crescendo in May of 2021, and I fear is going to resurge again this year, is blaming acts of the Israeli government on Jewish people. This is what happens. This is what happens. So then action taken by a government becomes the responsibility, the individual responsibility of each person of, who's Jewish, who identifies as Jewish, which makes them in an untenable position. So, and I got this question in a talk last night. What I urge all of you is really identify the clear differences between what the government is doing and what and who people are. Anti-Semitism is utterly unacceptable. Criticism of Israel is not. Sometimes criticism of Israel does cross in cross the line. And the helpful tool and Natan Sharansky, who was a Soviet refusenik, spent years in a Soviet jail before he moved to Israel and became a leader. He has a, the three Ds is his formulation. If criticism of Israel is demonizing Israel, delegitimizing Israel, or applying a double standard, it most often is anti-Semitic. But that doesn't mean all criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. All right, I think we just have a couple more uh, moments and I wanna try to get to everyone's question. Um, which, which by and large we have. Uh, Lydia, do you have any questions for me, putting you on the spot? Yeah, Jeffrey, you know, I, I have to confess that 
I don't know if it's of a question more so than an observation. I was less aware of the COVID exacerbation of some of the issues. I, I found that to be kind of alarming and disappointing, but, um, but do you have any other thoughts on intersectionality? Because our, our diversity and inclusion committee uh, does focus on that, uh, perhaps sure. a closing observation. It, it would be my, 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 my privilege. So as I said, you know, one of the complexities of the Jewish community is that it is so intersectional. 20% are Jews of color, as I mentioned. And that means all different types. This means people from Middle Eastern countries. This means people who are African-American and Latino. So that, in addition to all the other identities that people have, in addition to all the gender-based identities that people have, it's a very complex community. Thankfully, but what it requires from everyone, again, of good faith, is a recognition of that very fact, of the very fact that if someone who is Latino and says they're Jewish, the first thing is, that, well, when did you convert? Because maybe you were born with that Jewish identity. And so all those go into the workplace and as so many workplaces and society is focusing on different communities, what we have found and what we're trying to address right now is often a lack of awareness of the Jewish community and, and all of that. And the uniqueness of the Jewish American experience requires a unique approach, not like every other group, again, because we are so interconnected. And so all I can urge is everyone to get to know each other better, how they are, who they are, listen to their story. And I use those words very, very specifically. We all have our own story, but as much as, and you can probably get the sense, I'm happy to tell my story. It's just as important to listen to your story because that way we can all stand up together. I'm very appreciative of the time today and the opportunity to speak to all of you. Jeffrey, thank you so much for uh, helping us with this very enlightening discussion. A lot of great information in the slides as well that I'll, I know I will be revisiting. Um, as well. And I would just like to mention that if folks are interested in um, diversity and inclusion topics, we will be scheduling a meeting in the second half of February. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And with that, um, oh, let me just, yeah, let me just make sure that there's, ah, I see some wonderful comments, Jeffrey. Thank you. An important presentation, very en enlightening. Um, and so on, childhood experiences, interesting and so forth. So I just wanted to let you know that they were there in case they weren't visible in your feed. And thank you everyone. Have a great rest of your week and good luck securing all your CLE credits. Exactly. Thanks everyone. <laughs> thank you for joining me. All right. Mm -hmm.